Hello, everyone, and welcome to Nora's The Power of the Marketplace. Um, it's a webinar trilogy, and this is the second episode in a three-part trilogy, which is everything about marketplaces. I'll be your host for this session. My name is Lisa Powell. I'm the head of retail practice at Amblique, and many of you will know me from my e-commerce meetup shop talk. We're lucky enough to have joining us on the panel today, Lance Earhart, who's the General Manager of Everyday Market at Woolies X, and Jason Wyatt, the Executive Chair at Marketplace. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. The discussion will run for about 45 minutes and it'll be followed by 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. Now, how you ask the questions is that you just send them through in the chat. Um, these will all be answered, though, at the end of the session. And as with all my little panel meetups, we love to get questions. So do fire them through as we're going along. So today's Marketplace series, we're going to hone in on the development and launch of Woolies new Marketplace. But we'll also be covering off some of the what, when, where's and why's of Marketplaces too. Okay, so let's get things started. Lance, the big question. Why did Woolworths decide to implement a marketplace and why now? Thanks, Lisa. Look, it's, um, it's a really interesting thing to think about. And uh, at Woolies, we're always looking for ways to make customers' shopping experiences better than they were yesterday. And, um, and doing that in, in kind of the most forward thinking and technologically sort of supported ways. So we get about 12 million visits to our websites every single week uh, at the moment. And then that's sort of pretty standard over the past year. And, and so doing a range extension was something that was always a, a good way to better service our customers. We've had a lot of feedback from customers over the years. We've actually tried some range extensions it, it previously, but given our footprint uh, and the way we fulfill all of our orders out of our stores, um, the only way to actually do a meaningful range extension was to actually do it through a marketplace. So it wasn't necessarily a kind of why now thing. It was just uh, a, a way that we've evolved our thinking from how do we bring more for what the customer for the things they're looking for um, and then the best possible way to do it. So, and here we are with the marketplace uh, to do that. Great. So um, when someone's looking at a marketplace, what are the considerations that they need to think about when they're starting out around platform in particular? And why did Woolworths decide on Marketplace as their marketplace platform? That's a really good question. I think, one of the things we, we thought about when we came to approaching the technology is how, how to do it, right? So how to do it, who are the right partner? And it, it wasn't really um, a decision different to any other technology decision you make, whether you're thinking about your MarTech stack or, or anything else. And so we went through a pretty solid RFP process. I'm, I'm sure Jason's still got the scars from it. Um, and so we, we considered a lot of different options, including you know build, buy, borrow, like we've got a marketplace in the Endeavor business as most people would know. And so, when we went through that RFP process, um, we wanted to make sure we had a, a few key things ticked off. You know, scalability was one of them. Um, you know, partnership was another one. And a really important part of our decision-making process was, you know, how well could we partner with our, with our SaaS provider such that it wasn't just like a transactional SaaS transaction. It was much more of a partnership to scale. And so that's really where, in the end, the Marketplace team um, tipped over the edge through the RFP was their, their approach to partnership and, you know, working with us uh, to develop our, our platform and, and make sure that, you know, we were not just kind of plugging in something off the off the shelf, but actually working together on, on solving the problem. And for, for Woolworths, uh, we're a grocery retailer. We're quite different than uh, a lot of uh, retailers out there from an e-commerce point of view. So we always knew there was going to be some quirks and things that we're going to need to change um, about the way we work with the platform um, to, to enable it to be successful, if that makes sense. So Jason, from a, from your point of view, you're on the other side. So what do you think are the main considerations that people should be looking at when they're looking for a, a marketplace platform? Yeah, um, thanks Lisa and hi everyone. Great to see you, I hope you're traveling well. Um, it, it's interesting when we think about um, strategically why people wanna do a marketplace first, because ultimately, you know, that's a really important question to ask yourself. And, you know, doing a marketplace isn't about, you know, I'm going to plug in a new email marketing conversion tool that enables you to grow it, you know, 0.2% more conversion. It's a core growth strategy. So it's the next big thing in commerce. And it's, you know, if you want to grow by 
you, you start to talk about this marketplace strategic thinking um, behind it. And then, and just through our experience and our years in, you know, not only creating, but helping, you know, some amazing companies all over the world create and implement this marketplace strategy. I think one, one of the key things, you know, in working with an incredible organization in Woolies X to the scale that they're at in their operation um, was, was this, this sort of true partnership, not just the, not just a sales deck partnership where you put it on a slide and you set and forget it. It, it is, a, it was a really a joint effort. Um, it was a joint effort about understanding the, you know, the, the grocery market and, you know, deeply understanding and solving some of those problems. And, and what we sort of discovered on the way through and, and Lance can probably attest to it. It's not just, it's not just the marketplace um, problems that we get, you know, we, we sometimes get involved in it, but it's, it's the, it's the outside of that inner circle. So it's the logistics components behind a marketplace. It's deeply understanding um, the governance um, layer. It's how to, it's how to, when you create a marketplace, you're creating the community. Um, you know, you're going up and you're signing third party sellers into your ecosystem. So that reflects on your brand as much as it reflects on, um, you know, into, into your customer and consumer base. So it's all of those things that, you know, we have a lot of expertise and, and we really try and help our community sort of walk through um, into that journey. And it's because it's the next big thing and because it's a core growth strategy that can move that needle, um, we find that um, amazing partners like Ambly can, uh, and, our, and our group of partners within our ecosystem can really sort of lean in and help you um, on that journey as well. Great. So Lance, um as you said, putting in any of these e-commerce projects is never easy. So what have been your key learnings? Um, what surprised you and what major problems did you encounter that you think other retailers should think about? That's a great question and, and, and happy to share. I think one of the things we learned along the way is a lot more about our own stack, if that makes sense. So our own existing infrastructure and our own, it was, it was, it was less about kind of Jason and his team's infrastructure. It was actually more about ours. And, and what we found along the way were a lot of things that we, not only were they not fit for purpose for the scale of, you know, the types of products we're trying to bring on and, and, and the partners, they weren't fit for scale for our existing business. And it, it, it's, it's really interesting when you kind of have a massive team of people, Woolies X is a huge team. Often there's a lot of team members who are doing tasks that could very easily be optimized um, if you just you know stare into those things. So, so I think that was one of my biggest learnings along the journey was to say, well, actually, um, perhaps I would have stared a little closer into some of the the stuff in our side um, and and made a little bit more focus on some of those things that our teams are doing and whether we could optimize those you know before we even had a marketplace. Uh, uh, thing to do so that's probably one big thing that I would highly recommend people do when they're thinking about it is actually stare back into your existing business and think about if you try and put this stuff on top of it um, you know is it is that infrastructure already there people processes technology um, and I think the other thing that I learned uh, we learned on the way one of our biggest uh, it took us a little while to solve actually um, and, and Jason's team would, would talk strongly about how, how this was um, the way our operations is today as a grocery retailer and so where and when we do stock on hand checks, where and when we do payment checks, all these sorts of things are a little different than a typical, maybe a general merchandise retailer where, you know, you're relying on a live stock fee. When you're fulfilling from a grocery store and you're fulfilling bananas, you don't know how many bananas are actually on the shelf. So where you do that stock check is at a different point in time. And so Marketplace's platform uh, was fantastic. It was built perfectly for a, a you know, a, a live stock check situation. But for us, and when we do the stock check, it wasn't quite there. And it left us a pretty big gap that it's probably, I think it was maybe three months to actually solve that problem because it took some changes at our end. We had to re-engineer a few processes at our end and, and Jason's team had to do a little bit of work at their end to, to help us out as well. So, so I think those are my two major learnings is to think about what are the processes in your business before you even think about putting the marketplace on top of it? And are they even fit for today, um, let alone when you try and add the complication of kind of third parties and, and you know, potentially lots of extra products and, and, and SKUs? So I think that were probably my two biggest ones that are worth to share. Yeah, and I think it's a good point, Lance, because the world's moving completely towards event-driven architecture and live, live inventory calls uh, and not a call structure. So, and what I mean by that is so that whatever you're surfacing on your marketplace, it, it's accurate, it's live and, and a consumer can buy that. So 
yeah, that was a that was a really interesting learning. The other the other one I don't know, um, but is he, even some of these sort of the obscure things around the level of compliance and the level of um, if you like risk versus reward for someone like Woolworths around you know your seller terms and conditions and some of the re regulatory frameworks in that you know that was a that was a great journey on probably the most the level of work that your team had to do behind that it, it gives i think it gives a lot of the market now comfort that all of those hurdles are achievable as well great so um i think from my point of view and we're seeing it everywhere um, uh, I even look at Amblee, where um, putting lots of our retailers are talking marketplaces and we're actively working with them around those strategies. So how many marketplaces can there be in the industry? Are marketplaces really for everyone? Because at the moment, it does seem to be that it is the newest um, piece of equipment in the e-commerce arsenal. Lance, what do you think? Oh, look, I'll probably, I'll probably leave Jace for this one, um, mostly Lisa, but I think from my perspective, what a marketplace means to different businesses is a different thing. Um, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about what it means for, for Woolworths going forward um, a bit later in the chat. But, but I think what it means to, to different businesses is completely different things. Not every marketplace is, a, is an everything shop, right? Like, um, and so certainly ours isn't. Ours is very, you know, curated and, and staying close to our core. But, um, but so the question's a little bit open for me in the sense that I don't think there can be thousands of everything shops. However, what you do with a marketplace technology and, and commercial model will mean a different thing to different businesses. It, 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 so that's probably my perspective, at least. Um, Jace? So for you, um, Lance, it's, it can be more like a brand extension. So if you're like a you know, a women's beautiful clothing wear shop, you don't need to look at it as selling groceries, wine and beer, but you could look at it as selling beautiful homewares that fit in with your brand. Absolutely, Lisa. This is the way that we're thinking about our marketplace. It's mm -hmm. even internally, we aren't talking about it truly as a marketplace. We're, we're using a marketplace technology stack. We're using a marketplace commercial model, but we talk about it as a range extension. And, and so we're very much thinking about it as if you walk down the Woolworths aisles, and turned to the right and saw this product, would it fit or does it not fit? You know, is it, is it something that you would expect to find? And so, you know, we've talked publicly about it in our press releases and so on about the fact that we're thinking about like small appliances. We've got a small range in store. We'll put a few more on the website, you know, pet, baby, kind of the categories that, that customers, you know, really look for from Woolworths. And so I think the same could apply to other people's businesses where you don't, you know, to your point, you, you're not necessarily going to have a, an apparel retailer and start selling car tires, right? Like it doesn't necessarily have to be that. Um, so I, I think, you know, from my perspective, it does mean something different for each different retailer. And then they just need to think more about what does it mean for me and what are my customers, you know, need? Do they want everything from me or can I be a little bit more tailored with it, if that makes sense? So Jason, from your point of view, I'm sure you don't think there can ever be enough marketplaces, <laughs> but um, do you think they're for everyone? Well, I actually, um, I always start with the customer. And um, if, you're, if you're in business and you're not absolutely customer obsessed, I, I think you're probably not necessarily thinking in the right way. And so when, when we think and we work with our incredible, when we work with our incredible operators, um, that, that's our sort of starting point. Now, whether you call it a marketplace, whether you call it range extension, whether you call it dropship, um, you know, what the strategy um, enables you to do is start to sell and connect up things that you don't actually physically have to store within your warehouse that you typically wouldn't even consider storing within your warehouse, but it's on brand for your customer journey and CX map. So you're never going to, you're never, you're never going to move the needle so much that it feels off brand for who, what your DNA of your organization is, but what it enables you to do is to supercharge and to actually sort of power that next core growth strategy and you know there, there's so many incredible examples now of you, you wouldn't necessarily wake up and call surf stitch a marketplace but if you look at what surf stitch has done um you know they, they, they they've they've now they've now got the capability of selling surfboards where they're really hard to store they're really hard to ship um, they're really, uh, they're, they're, they're so many different suppliers, but they've opened up a big core growth category 
through launching a, a marketplace strategy and barbecues galore, um, which 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 was recently announced within that. It, it's not they're not going to go start selling power drills, right? <laughs> they're going into categories that they haven't previously been able to go into and, and really improve that customer experience for that obvious sort of next journey um, within that. The other, so from, from that consumer experience and increasing that lifetime value, you know, it, you know, it, it, it really re resonates back from the cost of acquisition. So if you look at your CAC back into what, where you can sort of really extract, um, you know, your merchandising value over a period of time, you know, we're seeing that, that those LTVs significantly increase. And then from a supplier base, you just become more important. So the, the vendor value as, of an organization on the supplier side, you, you obviously you, you're attracted to more suppliers, but you can go deeper within their supply base. So we're seeing that across the board and it's pretty consistent, whether it's um, retailers wanting to do it, whether it's brands like Nokia, um, you know, increasing their sort of portfolio behind it, whether it's your tribes, you know, linking up an existing sort of audience and, and really leveraging that or news organizations doing contextual commerce so that, you know, they necessarily don't want to start to, you know, open up warehouses to, to have an e-commerce business, but geez, they've got a massive audience that they can sort of leverage and, and, and start to convert for brands as well. So there's not too many businesses that we look at from a B2B, B2C, B2B to C perspective that, you know, can't implement this strategic initiative. Yeah, and I think it's great. It's um, it's like having, um, it's opening up the you might also like to be adjacencies that will work with the product that you already hold. Yeah, and I think as opposed to just selling on third-party marketplaces from a channel management perspective, what we love about it is it's nearly giving the brands the power back a little bit and, and they get to control their own consumers and consumer journeys a, a lot more than they've previously been able to do. So it's a it's an incredibly exciting proposition. Amazing. So Lance, what does a marketplace actually mean for Woolworths? Yeah, as I alluded to just before, Lisa, for us, it's very much about uh, extending the range of products that we can offer to our customers um, and, and staying really true to what Woolworths is. We're a food and everyday needs retailer, right? We're, we, you know, you can buy a select range of homewares, a select range of baby, a select range of pet, and so for us, it, it literally is just staying core to who we are um, and doing it in a super curated way. So you, you'll notice if you log on to our website, you'll start to see these ranges popping up. They're in those very natural kind of categories. And, and we're thinking about it very much as a, we, I mean, you, you can label it whatever you want. We think about it as a closed, uh, a closed ecosystem where we're inviting partners to be part of it who we believe will, will provide a great customer experience that a Woolworth shopper will, will, will enjoy, if that makes sense. So, so for us, it, it is that curated range extension. It is, you know, it is very much treating the customer as a Woolworths customer because they, because they are and making sure we provide a really clean experience for them, not just from the transaction on the website, but also all, all the way through the funnel back to the customer service and everything. So, you know, we're, we're thinking about partners that are, very good at fulfillment, you know, very good at kind of customer service so that we can provide this, uh, it's a Woolworths experience, less so of the kind of typical, you know, handoff to the seller type of marketplace, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's the sort of sellers you're going after. And I'm going to be really naughty here. The Nora people will smack me because I, I really like a question that's just come in. Um, how do you tackle vendor quality assurance to enhance the experience? Yeah, do, you, do you mean that from the from a product point of view or for actually from the partner? Um, from the sort of sellers that you bring on. So what sort of sellers are you going after and how do you tackle that quality? Issue, that quality? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really great question, actually. And um, the, the, the short answer is we have a very extensive kind of um, checks and balances and kind of checklist. And, and the team do spend a lot of time with that, with the potential partners before we even commit to, to working with them, right? So... My growth team are fantastic. They're, they're, they've spent a lot of time in researching the market first and then who are the right people to go and talk to to solve those customer problems that we already have. So, you know, desktop research on, you know, placing a few orders with them either through other marketplaces or directly. And so they do a lot of work up front before they even kind of pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, are you the right person to work with? Now, it's shifted a little since we've launched because we've had a lot more people coming proactively to us and saying, hey, we want to sell some stuff with you. 
But in essence, the team are doing going through the same process, right? They're, they're doing a lot of deep research desktop typically before we even have the first conversation to say, well, actually, is this going to be a great experience? You know, have you guys got a plan for it? And even, even down to who's your fulfillment provider, right? So, so for us, we're, we're, we're spending a lot of time, we're investing a lot of time in it. I don't think everybody necessarily does or has to do that, but I think because of our ambition to be very close to the Woolworths experience, we're investing that extra time up front to make sure that we are really, you know, working with the right partners for the right, um, I guess, the right ranges and the, and the right experience. So, um, and, and then the other thing I would say is um, we are very focused on Australian suppliers. So we're very, very focused on, you know, businesses that um, operate within Australia that are, you know, that have stock on shore, you know, so, that's where we've kind of really focused our energy is on that um, and, and a lot of smaller suppliers as well. So we're, we're starting to think much more about kind of these, you know, small suppliers that would never have been able to work with Woolworths before, you know, we're such a huge organisation. And so how do we unlock, um, you know, opportunity for these smaller businesses who have got fantastic products, by the way, they just don't have the access to consumers. And so if we put those products on a website that's getting 12 million visits a week, um, all of a sudden, that's a really big opportunity for these businesses. So, so yeah, that, that's probably the way we're thinking a lot more about it. And you know what? We've got the same thing every marketplace part, uh, has. That you know, we've got sort of terms and conditions and supplier policies and all these sorts of things. They're quite tight. They're a little bit restrictive, perhaps, than some of the other uh, marketplaces out there. But you know, again, we want to provide that great experience for our customers. So we're just investing that little bit more in it um, than perhaps some would, if that makes sense. You're on mute, Jax. Well, I'll ask you another question. There you go. I think, sorry, I think, Lisa, there's an important point in there around um, what we often say to our operators in um, the live connectivity that Marketplace gives you actually de-risks a lot of that um, because... I think there's an upfront validation that any brand needs to go through in, in assessing who they want to be part of their community. Um, but having accurate inventory flow back into source e-commerce or POS systems really sort of does help that in the journey. So we often say to our customers, attack our connectors, because these are businesses that are already shipping, that are already doing e-commerce businesses. So it's not a new thing that they're experiencing. And then you know, through our reporting modules, you can see of their performance and things like that. So the world of moving towards live connectivity uh, and the world we're living in of live connectivity really does de-risk this as a strategic initiative for you. Great. Okay. So I think this is the big one, having done a little bit of work with marketplaces myself. Um, you go from having an e-commerce store or, and or stores where you're dealing with customer service and all of a sudden you're dealing with customer service for product that's not your own. And you're also dealing with seller support. So how do you think about that? How do you manage that? And what sort of challenges are you looking at there? It's a good question. Um, the short answer is a lot of people, Lisa. <laughs> um, and maybe, maybe, maybe uh, I've got a little bit of a luxury compared to a lot of businesses, but we, we hired people early. Um, we're scaling slowly. We're not, we're not rushing to kind of hundreds of sellers, tens of thousands of SKUs. We have a big ambition in SKUs. We want to double our range this year. It's quite a lot. Um, but we've really started with some, I would say, friendly, some people who are willing to work with us to refine our processes, to refine our kind of ways of working so that when we do start to get some momentum and, and scale in the kind of partners and the SKUs we want to bring on, that we've got a bit more kind of, um, knowledge and a bit more kind of tightness around our process. We also did a bunch of global research. You know, we, we've got, uh, we know we've spoken to the, the folks at Walmart and a few others and kind of taken learnings from a lot of people to kind of front end a lot of it. Um, but we just, we, we got our people in place really early and just made sure that we were kind of working with people to make sure it actually will work. You know, seller support is one of the most important things you can do in a marketplace. It's not just kind of here's a connector and go away. You, you need to have people facing into these partners and really helping solve their problems proactively, you know. Um, our, ours is still a work in progress. We've got the great platform that, that marketplace have, but we want to do a lot more work in that space and provide a lot more self-service tools. But still, we're, we're going to maintain a team of people that are really just focused just on, you know, the seller success. Are they being successful for working with us? 
Then when it comes to customer service, we're, we're taking all the customer service for our customer hub. We have a very large team um, that look after our customers for our e-commerce business. Um, we also have a very great chatbot program as well. It handles about 60% of our total interactions happen through uh, the, the chatbot we call Olive. And so baking back as much as we can into those programs um, and kind of triaging it for our customers, it will mean that there will be some conversations between our customer hub and our sellers to kind of resolve some of those problems. But again, we want them to have a war- we want our customers to have a worse experience. So we're triaging it with our team. Um, and then as we find those focus areas, you know, a particular seller's got a particular freight problem or Aussie Post's a bit backed up, like we've all experienced just recently, um, we will be just be arming our, our customer hub and the chatbot with all that information so that, that the customer can just deal with us and we try to kind of minimise the, the noise in the system, if you like. It's not going to be perfect, by the way. We, we know it's not going to be perfect. And that's why that seller success team are going to be critical going forward to make sure that they're, they're just focused on making sure those sellers are successful. So Jason, not everybody's going to have um, the customer service team and the chatbots. What do, you, what do you think retailers need to think about around customer support and merchant support and merchant success from the get-go? Yeah, and it's something we help with a, a lot, right, because we've got a blueprint and a history um, in, in deeply understanding that. And what we try to walk through with brands is, and Lance we, we probably put a more structure, a, a more structured wording around it. We call it the crawl, walk, run philosophy behind creating a marketplace. So, you know, don't go out there and sign up a thousand sellers day one and, and blow up your ecosystem. Start with some friendlies like that. So walk through that, you know, that, that crawl phase, just, you know, get live, train your people, put a lot of emphasis in training your people. Uh, and then you, you're walking, you're starting to scale that up. Um, you know, you, you put on between maybe 10 and, um, 30 new sellers and then when you're really sort of sprinting through and, and you're running but at each phase there's a sort of a structure that we try and help our client base in in walking through in each of those and that's from it's not only from a technology perspective but there's a lot of tools we've developed over a long period of time from organizational charts roles and responsibilities the tasks that you need to have we've got a great knowledge base to assist our customers into that space so what we're we've got a huge emphasis in not just the technology but the overarching success of that crawl, walk, run philosophy. So I think we've brought up a few times it's come up around legal and governance. So Lance, from um, your perspective, anyone starting a marketplace, what do they need to be aware of around these topics? Uh, None of your policies will be right. Um, (laughs) None of them. Not one of them will be fit for purpose for for launching a marketplace. You, You need to think deeply about everything from your customer privacy, you know, returns, you know, refunds, like take every single policy you have in your business today and and then just stare into it and go, is this going to work when I start to expand into third-party partners coming into the ecosystem and so on and so forth. And so from a grocery retailer point of view, we have a lot of other regulation that sits around grocery. There's a grocery code, there's, you know, comparative unit pricing. There's all these other things that we had to stare into, which are, um, interesting things for, for us to stare into, but for, for the general, most businesses, just literally go and take every single document and, and think deeply about it. The other, the other thing that I think, um, you know, everybody will have seen um, that, you know, the HLC are doing a review on marketplaces at the moment. There's a lot of learnings you can take from where kind of some of the bigger marketplaces globally have, have tripped up, if you like, or have seen regulation in other markets that have not quite worked. I just say looking at it because there's a lot of policy that's not quite fit for purpose yet for this market. And so, you know, cog- be cognizant of that, read those documents, understand what they're looking for at and what they're looking for, and then think about how you, you structure yourself around that. I think outside of policy and governance, think about what's right for your sellers and right for your customers. We, we will be taking a position on a lot of things that is not regulated, but we're just doing it because we, we feel it's the right thing for the customer and the right thing for the sellers. So you don't always have to think about what is the the law telling you you have to do it. It's what's right for your customer and your seller. So, you know, we've taken a position on quite a few things around, you know, you know, performance and data sharing and other things that, you know, we don't have to, but we've chosen to as a, as a good corporate citizen and, and kind of respecting our partners and respecting our customers. So, you know, don't just think about it from the policies, uh, from a legal point of view, think about it 
from kind of how you want to operate in this ecosystem and, and how you want to be seen and, and part the types of partnerships you, you want to build. So, so that, that would be my biggest tip is, is yeah, is, is look at everything and then consider not just the law, but, um, you know, what's right for, for you as a business and for your partners. Jason, do you have anything to add? I think Lance um, summed it up really, really well is, um, you know, uh, turn turn over every stone in that in in that journey and um and i i think it's a it's a really important step but it's not overwhelming like they're not like catastrophic changes but it's just a piece of work that needs to be done in, in there as well and um and, and i think the level of work and diligence really does vary based on your category like um, we're talking we're fortunate enough to be talking to you know one of australia's if not like best retailer uh, and the spotlight and the level of diligence that they need to go through in the regulations and the different buckets that they need to focus on is a huge amount. But for smaller organisations uh, with less complicated products, it's definitely less burdensome as well. Right. So the big question, I think, for me, having been, what is it, coming up for 23 years in e-com, um, it feels like it's all gone around again. So, you know, 20 years ago, it was getting people to actually um, understand and accept e-commerce and getting the executive sponsorship and buy-in. And, um, you know, not that it hung off the end of tech or marketing or somewhere else that they could think of putting it, that they didn't need to look too much. With marketplaces, there's two things, I think. How do you gain executive sponsorship for a project like this? But also, we've all dealt with them, when you're dealing with people who are very excited by this new piece of tinsel, how do you pull them back? <laughs> so how do you get your executives on board and how you, do you control them not wanting to sell everything? It's, it's, a, it's a great question, Lisa. And, and look, I, I would say my experience is it always going to be very different to a lot of other businesses, depending on the size and scale of your business. But what I would start with is that... Um, Woolworths and Woolies X is something, it's, it's, it's a part of the business that Woolworths has been investing in for a couple of years. So we've already got a really good kind of exec sponsorship from kind of Brad and the board down um, on, on doing these new things for our customers in, in, in perhaps a way we, we haven't done before, right? So I've been quite blessed with the sponsorship spine between Brad and then Amanda and Woolies X, Bay, who, who's my line lead it's not them that we've necessarily needed to kind of, let's say, get on board or sell. Um, but what was really important for us was actually the other executives around the organisation so that what you talked about there, people getting too excited or kind of these road barriers pop, cropping up along the way. And, and it was really through education and keeping it focused around the customer, right? Jason mentioned it earlier. It's one of the most important things we can do is really help them understand what is it that we're doing and what is it that we're not doing? Because, you know, automatically everyone went to kind of the big global marketplaces and so on, like you're going to you know, be like that. And, and the short answer for us was no, here's our proposition. So we did invest a lot of time um, up front. I certainly was very choiceful about how I hired my team as well. I, I brought into my team and there's a question in the chat about team, but we can come back to that later. But with my team, I've got a very good mix of both internal Woolworths people who have been around for five, 10, even 15 years, um, and some external talent to make sure that we had this deeper connection back to the business. So we, through the whole journey, have focused on that. It's all about communication. It's all about education. It's all about under helping people understand the why and the what are we, less about the what actually, but more about the why are we doing it. Um, and, and that was kind of the getting people on board and, and you know, staying out of the way. As it pertains to the tinsel question, um, you know what, like people get excited by these things and, to be honest, we let them in. Um, we, we, we genuinely let them into the conversation. You know, we invite them to, a, to kind of our showcases and our ceremonies and, and, and kind of what we're doing so they know what, what's happening. And we, we let them come a little bit closer to the detail. And yes, everybody's going to have an opinion, but as long as you take that opinion on and, and kind of have an answer for it at some point in time, you know, most people have kind of come on that journey. And, and to, like, I've got a, a relatively sizable team, but it's probably nearly double that by the people that are just kind of leaning in and, and getting interested. And we just let them do it. You know, we let them ask the questions and be curious. And as, as long as we can kind of come up with the answers as a team, then it, it's meant that it's kind of stayed somewhat out of the way, if you like, of, of what we've been trying to do. So I think, you know, communication and education and, and sticking, 
very co core to the why for the customer um, has been our kind of approach to it. It's worked pretty well. I mean, it took us still took us 12 months to stand the thing up, but it, it, it was less about people getting in the way and more about the actual work we need to do for that timeline, if that makes sense. Yeah, right. and, I, and I think nice. um, it's something we've actually heavily focused on, right? Because when we invented Marketplace, uh, we were inventing a category at really effectively at the same time. So we weren't only figuring out how to go to market with our technology product. We were actually trying to convince the market that it was a good idea. <laughs> and yeah. and that, that's an interesting journey that we've gone in over a long period of time now. And we've, what we really developed was a, a series of tools. Um, we call it our platform for growth, where we walk our customers before they even sign up to technology or sign up to cost. We walk them through a group of strategic workshops with our partners. And, and this is where we you know, evaluate the strategy. It, does it actually fundamentally make sense for you? Is this, is this, although it could be the next core growth strategy, but does it make sense for your business and your customers today? Um, we, we actually produce a, um, a sort of, a, a, you know, a rough guide to a P&L and what it can look like for the size of the prize um, within, the, within the ecosystem. And then we deeply go through a, a, a technical workshop to understand what Lance, what Lance was talking about today, but, you know, the integration layer or leveraging our pre-built connectors into some of the major e-com platforms so that it's just faster on ramp um, to do that side of it. And then the, the second piece of the puzzle around executive, like I'm excited now, I've signed up, you've told me you're going to grow, like I want it tomorrow kind of answer from a CEO level is we just leverage our data and experience around implementations to do that. So on average, our implementation strategy, you know, and, you know, th this is the, our implementation plans and strategy isn't just the tech focus, it's a holistic business view to get the marketplace live from legal and governance. So it covers all of the streams. So you can go into that process having a huge amount of confidence that, you know, 90% of your bases are covered. That there's the, you haven't, we haven't not discovered stuff that hasn't been thought of before. So we're that trusted partner and our partners are those trusted partners that can walk you through that process. So, you know, we leverage things like a growth customer is an average, is an 87 days average onboarding time. And then to actually, to get to any scale takes probably another three months by the time you go out there and, and pump some scale through that ecosystem. Um, a project like Lance's is clearly going to take longer in a much, much larger organization, but we have a lot of data around those timelines and what it means. So what we really try to do is in that partnership phase of that business is to really, really sort of share the broader ecosystem so you can go into that with confidence. Right. And so Lance, from your perspective and from the Woolies perspective, what does success look like for your marketplace? That's a great question. And um, we, we had this question when we went through the press rounds as well. For, for us, at the moment, we're, we're purely focused on scalability of the platform. So can we do this at a, at, a, at a level of scale where we're still meeting our customer expectations? So that's my core focus with the team right now is can we get through the next 12 months, get to some sort of scale and, and, and the, the, you know, the wheels not fall off almost is probably the, the short answer. And, and, and our metric is very much around the customer. It's very much around... Is this an experience that our customers are enjoying? Are we actually, you know, getting better customer experiences, better VOC scores, better kind of, um, you know, feedback from our customers as, as a result of this particular, um, you know, initiative? It's one of many initiatives Woolworths is doing to serve the customer better. Um, and so that's really where we are focused. Um, it, it is, and then longer term, I think the thing for me is that we still stay, you know, core, core to who we are. Um, I think success for me still looks like when you shop on Woolworths.com.au, you feel like you're shopping on Woolworths.com.au. You feel like you've gone for your grocery and everyday needs shop and, and staying really core to that, what the customer expects from us. So, so it's not jolting. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's, you know, it, it, it's it, it literally, it honestly is all about, you know, that customer and making sure we're serving them better. So, so, you know, again, I don't expect to see, um, you know, selling cars on allwest.com.au at all. Um, but, but you know, staying core to what we're doing and, and really doing a better job than we were doing yesterday in some of those areas that, you know, customers want more from us, you know. Like we we know through customer feedback that the range of nappies and, and kind of things in our stores is fantastic for, for the, kind of everybody. But, you know, there's, there's still quite a bit missing in that range. And so that's what we're looking to supplement. And so pleasing those customers and making their experience better, it really is the, the key to the success. Yeah. 
And so this, I'm going to pose this to both of you. We'll start with Lance and then we can go over to Jason. If you had your time again, what would you do di differently? So what are your top tips for those contemplating a marketplace? Great question. And um, I think we've covered a bit of it through the conversation already, but just to, to hone in on it, um, I would have stared into our systems processes like earlier. We've done it through the, the period. Um, I think I could, we, should, we could, probably could have shaved about a couple of months off our delivery had we kind of stared into some of those things a little earlier. And, and, and you know, just as a one kind of core one, you know, our, our product, our product onboarding, not customer, not seller, the product, as it, how does a product get from a data system, in this case, marketplace of being the source of the data to live on our website? Um, what's all the steps through there? And in a lot of businesses, you know, some, some, some people have got it really, you know, really, really good where they've got it a lot automated. Some won't, some will have some quite manual process in there. And I think it was one of the things that, that um, slowed us down a little bit. So that, that would be number one. The second thing is um, I would have reordered some of our policies that we looked at. You know, we, we just we just probably got that order out, out of whack a little bit. You know, there's privacy policies and all those things we looked into. And I think we just got the order of that a little bit wrong. And um, probably more so because we focused on the, the privacy policies and the customer policies very, very early. Um, whereas we learned a lot through the journey um, and had to actually touch those policies a few more times. Not that we've had to publish on the website or anything like that, but you know, our legal teams were, were will touch them a few more times than they needed to. So the just, you know, what's the right thing to focus on at the right time from that, that point of view. Um, and the other one I would say is um, my learning, I think we got this relatively right, but I think it's worth to share is really think about how you phase your team um, that are delivering this, right? You know, it could be technology teams, it could be your growth teams, it could be your seller success teams. But I think we got this pretty good. I think I probably would have done it a little different in hindsight. Um, I might have perhaps front weighted a few, few roles and, and, and pushed a few back. But, but I think it was a really important part of our journey of having the right people on board at the right time so that, you know, you could start the seller conversations and get the feedback and bake it into your plans so that, you know, you could have the success team. Before we even had sellers, we had a success team and they could be working on their processes and kind of, you know, talking to those friendlies to work up what they were going to do. So really important, you know, you don't want to just dump everybody in at the same time, but similarly, you don't want to wait for the last minute to hire people either. It's, um, it was good to phase that team and grow it slowly in line with kind of the delivery of the entire project so that we weren't just delivering technology, we were delivering all the policies, procedures and ways of working alongside that technology delivery so that when we got to being able to be live, it wasn't a huge rush and hurry to get people on board, if that makes sense. And Jason, what do you think? Yeah, mine are um, actually probably not that marketplacer um, centric because that we're really known within that platform for growth and the technology phase. We, we you know, we continually improve. We're very comfortable with it. It's actually, it's more anchored around um, identifying what we say is your unfair advantage, your right to play in the space, and, and why do you, why is it why does it make sense for you? And and typically that fundamentally always anchors around your core customers and their needs and wants. So where we say up front is do your research with your customers around what other products do they really want to buy from you and why does it make sense for your brand and why does it enhance your brand story? Why does it give you the right to play in the space and improve your ultimate experience? Um, and then when, when I think of the second sort of key learning we take from working with um, you know, incredible operators all over the world is actually internal alignment. And I think Woolworths is a, you know, an incredible example of internal alignment behind it. But um, having, having that connected strategy back into your existing e-commerce strategy means that your buyership and um, the, the, the potential cannibalization that might exist in a marketplace strategy and the internal alignment with your buyership. And like one of the key mistakes we often make, we often see, sorry, is the fact that the buyers aren't completely on board with the marketplace strategy and that they think it's a it's an internal fight. It's not. You need to relook at them potentially the way the buyers are incentivized, 
because they've got the best knowledge around the customer. They understand the customer better than anybody else. The only difference is you don't have to stock it in your warehouse. You don't have to put up the capital and you can try new innovative categories in a really clever way. So I think when I look back over a sort of a lot of reflection around the sort of two key things, it's, it's really sort of identifying that unfair advantage and where's your right to play into what categories. And second, nail your internal alignment and buying and vision behind it and, and you'll be in good stead. Excellent. Well, I think that brings us to a really nice place where we can start to look at some of the questions that have come through. And there's some actually really interesting ones. Um, so Lance, I think um, we'll just start at the top. Okay, and we'll just work through them. Um, one, of course, I've snuck in already. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you tackle creating a URL structure that can scale with your business growth over time? So what are your considerations there? Who wants to start with that one? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's a wizard. It's hard. It, it, it is a tough one. And to be honest, it's a tough one in oh. a really big business like Woolworths, right? Like, it, it's um we've already got a very large website, very large visitors, very large product range, and actually pretty complex business when you think about you know fulfillment from stores and, and all those sorts of things. So I would say Woolies probably solved this probably three or five years ago, and I think that's probably so I haven't necessarily had to solve this as part of our journey, but uh, what I can share to say is that. Um, the, that importance of that foundation work, as I've spoken about with the product onboarding and other things before, but we wouldn't have been able to do this without the foundation of Woolworths or, that we had today. And so it is a really good question to, to stare back into your, your URL structures and, you know, what are the, you know, how are you going to present these, you know, these depends how many products you're going to do to make sure you can scale. Um, but I would say I haven't had to tackle that problem so much. It, the problem was probably mostly solved for me. Um, so, Jace, I don't know if you've got any further learnings from others where they've had to change their URL structures to accommodate. Well, I don't think it's a marketplace issue to start with because, like, yeah. the reality is the people who are scaling in marketplaces have an existing econ business, and it's something you should be solving anyway around your silo structure and category structure around your URLs. What I can say, what a marketplace strategy gives you is the power to play in categories in search and SEM, we've never been able to pay, play before because, and, and you're, leveraging that, you're leveraging that right to play because you've got other people's inventory on your, your website. So it gives you so much more power within your search engines and your SEM capability um, and so much more relevant scores within each of those so that you can actually sort of convert at a higher rate. So what we typically find is your um, direct SEO and SEM traffic is much more efficient and can scale at a much faster rate because you're in so many more categories. Okay, I think I'll go to the next question here, which um, I always find really interesting, which is um, how do you go after SEO competitiveness? competitiveness? And the other thing I would uh, um, add into this, how do you juggle what you're doing around SEO with your um, sellers? Um, you know, sellers who own a big brand who are coming on with you and, and talk to you outright about are we going to be in comp competition to each other? Yeah, that's actually a brilliant question because it was a consideration we've had to stare into for a couple of reasons. And for, for, mo for a lot of people may or may not know, our, our launch partners are actually internal Woolworths businesses. So, you know, we launched with Big W, uh, we launched with Pet Culture, with, with Healthy Life. So, you know, forget about external partners, how we talk about where do we rank. It's, it was even an internal conversation that we had to kind of stare into, if you like. And so I think um, my general advice to this would be Make sure that you're, what you're putting on your website stacks up to your existing kind of, you know, if you've got your SEO sorted out, make sure you're making, you're getting the right information to make sure that your sellers' products do the same thing. Have a very open and honest conversation with your sellers. We, we had, we've had a couple of potential partners, ones that are, you know, not, not necessarily on board yet, where we've had to have a pretty in-depth conversation about that. And um, ultimately it's going to come down to kind of how good, how good a quality can you do? Because, what I would say is the information that you get from partners is not as good as the information they're presenting on their own website. The, the metadata is not there. It's, it's, you've got to kind of, you almost have to do that work yourself. So you, you need to think a bit about that um, 
and how you are enriching what's going onto your website to a level that you know you, you will show up in some of those um, SEO scores. You'll find now if you were to go look for some of the things on Woolworths website that are there today, some of the early products we won't be winning in, in those SEO scores, even though our SEO kind of scoring is very 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 strong. The, the other partners will be will be winning still because the level of data we've been able to put through into the the product pages and, and the content is just not yet there with those products. So the on the partner thing, have a conversation with them. Um, be quite open and honest, um, but be aware they're probably going to beat you anyway initially at least because the they've got a deeper, richer kind of metadata set, and 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 so the algorithms just aren't going to pick it up early days if that makes sense. So. It's a good question, though. Um, it is something we tackled along the way, and there have been some tough conversations internally across those internal businesses, actually, on how we're going to manage this going forward. I uh, think one of the other ones that come out of that as well that I've experienced is around conversations around SEM and who, who's bidding on what as well is quite um, is another big conversation that you actually have to have, especially if you're going with a very well-known brand. So, um, I mean... We're very lucky at Wars. We have an internal team that manage all of that. So we're able to take a call, especially on our internal businesses, about how we're going to manage that in, a, in, in the right way. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it, it is a consideration. You know, you could very easily get into a bidding war with somebody you're trying to partner with. So it yeah. is to think about um, as you go forward. I think it's a really interesting space, right? Like, because like the reality is it doesn't matter what Woolworths do. Then, then if you're a brand, unless you're doing a really bad job, they can fundamentally can't beat you on your brand in SEO. Like you've got to be doing a catastrophic job around that. So then you're talking around the fringe search searches and the, or the category based searches primarily, I think uh, as a, as a fundamental. And within that it's, it's, it's a noisy space anyway. And chances are you're already in a competitive landscape um, for that. Um, so um, then I think about the other flip side of the coin is that yes, search and SEM is one component to it is, but Lance just told us, you, how many visitors do you get a week? 12 million. 12 million shoppers a week who want to buy something. What's that worth to you to be in that ecosystem? And it's a good debate moving forward that that's a more powerful ecosystem that's got a logistics network built into it, that's got a customer loyalty program built into it, that's probably a deeper, more rich in shopping experience than just clicking on an SEM ad in Google, right? So it's where you want to play with the buyer intent into the future. So what's necessarily has worked for you in the past, you know, it's hundred percent got a place to play. Don't get me wrong, but this is the, this is potentially the future of that channel management space. So, um, and what's that worth to you um, within that ecosystem? So, yeah, you know, I think it's a really, really interesting debate and it's a fascinating one. What I will say when you're creating a marketplace is um, you're building a community and behind building a community, you're building trust, authenticity um, and friendship ultimately within that. So I don't know many marketplaces who completely attack their brands and their categories at an SEM level to aggressively outbid them. And I think it's a very dangerous space to play if you're playing in the marketplace space. Yeah, totally. Um, Lisa, I might take one out of the actual chat function here, which I think is, um, I touched on team before, but Emily's asked, um, what sort of skills or experience are you looking for in, in your internal marketplace team? And what is a good profile background? Uh, is it hard to find them? I think it's a really great question because it is something we kind of struggled with a little bit along the way. And, and what I would say is, the, the internal team, uh, the, the marketplace team, they're not marketplace people. Uh, you know, I don't think it's, um, there is people that have worked in marketplaces before and all those type of things, but we haven't necessarily focused on kind of, have you had 10 years experience working in a marketplace business? You know, the very specific kind of tasks. Uh, onboarding is, is, is one of those things where kind of we started with a place, well, maybe people have had an onboarding experience, they've done it for others, so maybe that'll be good for us. But so what we focused on was more transferable skills. So, you know, what are we actually trying to get out of that interaction? You know, the seller success piece, you know, do we need kind of account managers from another marketplace or actually is it just a skill set um, that's transferable? You know, have they, you know, whether it's been customer support or whether it's been seller support in kind of SaaS platforms or kind of what are the, what are the actual skills we need in these people rather than, you know, where do they come from, if that makes sense and have they had a deep experience in it? 
The second thing I, I mentioned it before, it was so important for us that we had some internals and externals. You know, you can avoid the whole thing Jace talked about with the conflict with the buyers if you perhaps bring one of them on the team and, and kind of really get a good kind of mix of fresh face and and kind of existing team, if that makes sense. I would still say bring some new new skill sets into your business when you do it, but but um, make sure you try and supplement that with some existing team, just so you can get a really good handle of kind of how you how your organisation works and interacts and how you navigate that. So, so yeah, so great question, Emily. We have really taken an approach of transferable skills rather than trying to look for these unicorns because you know they don't exist yet. I think in ten years' time, maybe when everyone's got a marketplace, maybe there's some trading of that skill set around the market. But for now, I think you're going to have to create it, and I think be very choiceful about. What are the, what's the experience you want that customer, whether it's customer, whether it's seller, whether it's team to have and, and kind of try and find that from another, another capability is probably where, where I'll, that would be my turn. And I do always think that it's a great idea to look internally. I mean, you have buyers, you have merchandisers, you have people who know what they're doing. Um, yeah. And I think it's, um, you know, it's an exciting extension as well to their career. Yeah, for sure. I think it's going to be important for all of us, not, not just marketplaces, as digital, uh, people in digital and technology. I think bringing people on that journey and cross-skilling and upskilling people is going to be the path to more successful digital businesses. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the ones I am interested in through experience is how do you tackle um, efficiencies around de efficient delivery times when you've got all of these external people um, and I think they've put in here, are you looking at partnerships like DoorDash and Uber Eats, which I think sort of takes it off to another level. But I think delivery times, you know, as we all know, the problem with most customers is around where's my product and, um, and you know, stock accuracy and delivery are the two major things as to, I find, as to why people actually come back and buy from you again. Yeah, Lisa, I think, do you know what? It's something we've really focused on because it's clearly a key thing. and. Um, you know, whether it's through the marketplace or APIs or we've actually launched the pre-built connection into ship it locally um, within the Australian market. And that means every single seller within the marketplace or seller portal can actually put their um, ship it merchant ID, which unleashes all of their traditional shipping metrics onto the marketplace. And it's, it's really insightful. And then when they actually want to, um, when they actually want to um, dispatch their orders, if they're in a pre-built connectors, they just do it normally within um, their Shopify or the Magento portal um, or, or within um, or within big commerce, or they can actually do it live through the um, marketplace or seller portal back into ship it. So I think it's these deep ecosystem partnerships to proven existing logistics providers and scalable solutions that he's going to cut through. And it's, it's happening at a rapid rate and it's a, it really is a solved problem, but it's a, a continued focus for all um, platforms as we move forward right yeah ditto <laughs> um, <laughs> choose the right partners you know understand their supply chains um kind of work with known um providers those sorts of things i, I think it's a, a it's a tomorrow problem to solve still for me i think it's something that as an entire market australia is kind of moving forwards at it's been very very slow in the past 10 years but i think it is accelerating and i think um you know, making sure that data is good is probably the most important thing at this point. Certainty is super important to customers. So getting your data flows and what you're presenting back to and managing the customer's expectation is the most important thing. But so the second thing after that was, you know, you need the partners that have that capability who, you know, have an existing supply chain, who have existing partnerships and have existing connectors. So that it all comes together. Um, it is a big focus for us though, and it'll be something we continue to focus on as we go forward. So I think we have time for one more question. So Lance, is there something there that you think is particularly relevant? Oh, um, large change management project, I think. Yeah, I think we tackled that a little bit before. I think so. Uh, how do you find opportunities to add to new skills that customers really want to see? Um, I think Jake touched on that a bit before. Do your customer research, speak to your customers. They're, they're the most important person in this. So. Um, Hmm. I think we've covered most of them though, haven't we, Lisa? Um, I think we have. I think we've done um, pretty well, to tell you the truth. I think it's been a really um, interesting, I've learned a lot. I actually love marketplaces. So um, 
brand extensions is something that I've been passionate about for years. And I think it's really interesting to hear about how a um, established retailer has gone on that journey rather than someone just popping up as a marketplace on their own. I think it's, um, you know, there's untouched potential for everybody around um, looking at adjacencies and brand extension. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think it's something that you know, we'll, we'll continue to say um, is, and think as a business, think about, like I said at the start, what does it mean for you? It doesn't have to be an everything shop. It just needs to be really core focused around what you want to be as a business, what your customers want and expect from you. So, um, you know, think a lot about that is probably my the thing I would leave you with. No, right. um, I'd like to thank everyone for share, taking your time to listen to sort of Lance's um, story today. It's really appreciated. And maybe my leaving point might be you know, start and finish with the customer experience. I think it's a really important thing. Exactly. I think if you hold your customer, you're thinking about your customer, you're thinking about what your customer wants, you're thinking about how you're going to deliver for a customer, it's definitely um, the best way to look forward. Well, I want to thank everybody for attending. I hope you found the session as useful um, as I have. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And in particular, I want to do a big thank you to both um, Lance and Jason. You great insights. Thanks for being so open and so, you know, actually talking to the guts, really, of what marketplaces are. And thank you so much for making the time and getting involved. Um, I want to let everybody know that the recording of this session will be sent out afterwards. Um, and um, I think you will receive it as an email. I'm not sure, probably a day or two after, um, after we're finished. And I also would encourage you to register for the third episode in this trilogy. So um, it is going to be uh, talking with SurfStitch about marketplace innovation. You can find the details on the Nora website, but I'll just let you know it's on November 5 at the same time from 11 to 12. And I really do think that marketplaces are really um, a great new growth and customer um, extension, customer, um, a, a, a way to give your customers more of what they want. Um, and I think it's something that's worth most retailers looking at in some capacity. So I would encourage you to join along and listen to what um, SurfStitch have to say about what the innovations that the marketplace is allowing them to bring to their customers. So thank you everyone for being a part of this. Um, thank you, Jason and Lance. Really good to talk to you both again and um, hope to see you around next time. Thanks so much. See you everyone. Thank you. Bye.